Hey, and we're live. Well, look at that. It's September, right? <laughs> it is September. Well, I feel like uh, the fall is starting here in New Hampshire, and it's, it's starting to look like October. But it's still technically September. So here we are in our September photo focus uh, hangout on Lightroom. And unfortunately, my good buddy Levi Sim uh, is unable to join us today. He's doing something even more important than this, which is hard to believe, but he is. Um, but I do have a very special guest, uh, fellow Photo Focus contributor, Jason Hahn, is, is here with me, and uh, our wildlife uh, nature photographer specialist um, is going to kind of fill us in on some, some of his tips and tricks for using Lightroom and even just shooting wildlife in general. So, Jason, welcome. Uh, Thank thanks for joining me. I'll say us, but it's me. And uh, <laughs> tuning in. So, tell us a little bit about you. Where are you geographically? And how do, you, how do you come to this whole? Oh, uh, sure. I'm uh, currently I'm in Florida. Um, I shoot probably, oh, I'd say 75% of the time I'm taking pictures of wildlife, landscapes, all kinds of things down here. Um, I'm actually originally from Maryland, and I do travel quite a bit. Um, and you know, that's really my my big passion is just capturing the outdoor world, capturing all those little intimate moments that uh, we don't always get to see. So I have a lot of fun, and fortunately, it's a, uh, as you can see behind me, this is the home office. It's actually a family business. My wife is a business manager, and my son actually does some of my uh, image uh, editing and processing. So it's, a, it's very cool to have a lot of fun. Yeah, well, that's great, keeping it keeping in the family like that and, yep. uh, and, and still loving and, and liking each other. Yeah. <laughs> that's great, too. <laughs> um, so I wonder if maybe we can kind of start and – if you have some maybe tips about just kind of when you're heading out shooting for, for wildlife or nature, or maybe even how you define those things, because I don't know, it's probably, if it's an animal, is it wildlife, if it's not as a nature, right. I don't know. Yeah. Um, and uh, and I know you, you probably have some good content on Photo Focus already that might touch on that, but it might just kind of set the stage and then we can kind sure. of dive in on, on Lightroom parts. Yeah, well, and I'll give you a little preview of an article I'll have coming up in the not too distant future is uh, about life cycles photography. And this is an approach I take with just about all nature I do. I, I look at it from the perspective of whether it's a wild animal ecosystem is capturing everything about them. And, you know, sometimes with animals I'll get, uh, let's say I have a great blue heron, beautiful bird. I've photographed them probably 10 zillion times. Um, and you get to a point where it's like, what else can I do with this? So the way I approach wildlife is I, I think about every aspect of that animal's life from, in the case of the heron, from the moment that it hatches to the, you know, uh, reproduction, feeding, all those kinds of things. And the cool thing with animals is you never run out of things to shoot when you start thinking about it that way. Um, this past spring, I had the opportunity uh, to photograph a sandhill crane nest. And, you know, we have two cranes, two chicks, and photographed everything from pretty much the moment they started building the nest through the hatch to the point that the chicks had fledged. And if you think about how much you can capture in that, it's a really uh, neat approach, and you learn so much about the animal. I'm a big believer that to be a better nature photographer, you need to be a better naturalist. Yeah. And the more you learn about the, the animals and the ecosystems they're in, the better your pictures are going to be. Yeah, well, that's that's a huge part of it. Is um, you know, the more you know about pretty much any subject, probably safe yes. to say, the better job you're going to do photographing it. Goes double for wildlife and nature because it's it's not it's not us, it's not people. So you have yeah. to know a little bit more about when they come out, when they go in, when they eat, when you know when all they do those things, uh, and that's and that's great. Now, do you also um, so do you sell prints? Do you license these for yeah. the stock? Like, where do you? We do a variety of different ways. Um, I basically have three businesses. <laughs> so that we have to take different approaches with the, all of them. And I, I think one of the big things as we've seen our transition to the digital age and the, the days of just being a stock photographer are kind of over um, is you really have to diversify. In our case with nature, you know, everybody loves to go out and photograph nature. So you have to find a way to um, make it, you know, pay the mortgage. And the way we do it is we sell gift type items, which, you know, home decor, things you hang on the wall. Uh, you know, I design a whole uh, range of um, home products like coffee mugs and cutting boards and all kinds of things. So we, we sell in that way. We still sell stock. Um, uh, I submit to Adobe Stock and um, a couple other agencies. And then we also sell on our own. 
And with stock, we're dealing with um, a lot of different entities, everything from I've sold stock to tattoo artists for somebody who wanted a wolf tattooed on them. Oh, wow. You know, good for them. I'm not getting my pictures tattooed on me. Yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, to uh, we do a lot of government signage, education programs, things like that. So if somebody's out on a trail, they have interpretive signage. We may have you know pictures on that, uh, textbooks, um, all kinds of things. And then the last way is education, as um, sharing the stuff, learning how to do it. Uh, I do workshops. Um, I actually do a lot of um, you know pro bono kind of things, working with schools and, and um, uh, young people, getting them involved in it. And uh, so we spend a lot of time on that feature, really sharing the outdoors, sharing the whole nature photography experience. Great. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, the diversifying is key. I think it's probably key for lots of people these days because there's it's hard to have just one income stream. And feel really good. Yeah. About it. Um, but a big mistake, especially in nature and, and with all all sorts of um, photography, is the idea of exposure. You know that I will trade you exposure and get, use your picture, and yeah. the bank just doesn't take exposure. <laughs> you know, you're funny about that. It should. It should. Yeah, I know. <laughs> um, so you know, once you set your price at zero, it's really hard to come up from there. So it's really important for people to value their work. Um, and you know, look at the amount of time you put into it. Look at the um, your cost of your equipment. All those other little intangibles. And if you're giving away your work, you're really doing yourself a disservice. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, before I forget, because um, I'm, I'm prone to forgetting things. Uh, so <laughs> we are giving away uh, two perfectly clear, complete plugins for Lightroom at the end of our hour. And the way that you uh, get entered into that drawing, it's very easy, it's totally free, is that you just leave a comment or question. We love questions. Comments are nice, but we love questions. Uh, but stop and say hello. We've already had a couple hellos. Uh, Myrna and Tess uh, chimed in. So just say hi, and that enters you in. But if you have a question about uh, Lightroom, about Lightroom in the, in the realm of nature wildlife photography, or, or about wildlife nature photography in general, uh, please fire fire those away, or even stock photography in general. Hey, sure, we'll take we'll take it. So, um, at the end of our time here, I'll um, don't have Levi's hat, but I'll have to dig something up and pull out a couple names and put we'll those away. <laughs> All right. So, uh, so Jason, so when you're out shooting in your sandhill crane or whatever it is your your subject is, are you are you kind of thinking about your post processing while you're shooting uh, in terms of how you shoot? Uh, or does it does it not matter? Yeah, um, I, I very much do, and and this has been a this was a bit of an epiphany for me after I've been shooting for a while was to really think about the post processing uh, side of it, and the the way I put it, especially when I'm you know uh, leading workshops myself, is that you know every picture it starts in your imagination, you complete it, you know you you create it in the camera, but you finish it in the digital darkroom. So there are many, many times where I'm out in the field and I'm already thinking through that process, especially you know in terms of what the light is doing, what the colors are doing, those sort of things. Um, you know, is this something that I may need to crop? Um, and especially with, with animals in, in particular, because as our sensors have gotten bigger and we have, you know, I don't necessarily want to shoot every shot thinking of the crop. But on the other hand, now that I have 30, 40, 50 megapixels to deal with, I can err on the side of not getting too close to that animal and potentially stressing it and recognize that I can crop off some of that image to refine the composition. So I am always reading behavior when it comes to animals and um, you know, really paying attention to their body language. That's a really, you know, granted some you know, reptiles don't have a lot of body language. <laughs> right. Uh, you know, yeah. right. The body language of the banana slug, you know, just <laughs> but it's gonna most, strike. Yeah. Most mammals, most birds, they're telling you what they're feeling. They're reacting to stressors in their world, and you can get a really good idea of what they're gonna do before they do it. And I know that this is terrible, but you know, with birds, always look for the pre flight poop. Um, you know, they're going to shuffle their wings, they're going to wing stretch, they're just getting ready to fly. Now, if they're spooked, they're just going to jump. But sometimes they're just tired of sitting, they're getting ready to go out to hunt. You can see all those things, and the last thing they do 
is unload a little extra weight. So, <laughs> uh, you know, when you see that's it, the that's the money shot. That's yeah. What you're <laughs> so when you see that, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to pre-focus, turn just a little bit, because they're going to jump into the wind and catch them as they jump into the frame hmm. instead of having them, you know, the butt as I'm reacting nice. to it slowly. Yeah. So it's little things like that that make such a big difference. Yeah, that's huge. I mean, obviously, that's a huge thing. Especially yeah. standing there for potentially a long time waiting for that yeah. moment <laughs> to, to happen. Yeah. yeah, so, you know, paying attention to those little things and then knowing that if I shoot it just a little wider, um, you know, I'm going to crop after the fact, not a huge amount, but I have the leeway to do that. Uh, maybe I'm going to shoot a little higher ISO, knowing that noise reduction has gotten so much better. Right. And, um, you know, I'd rather have a sharp but grainy shot rather than an out of focus shot. Absolutely. Yeah, that's right. So you kind of, there's a, there's always a trade off of some sorts. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, the art of the compromise. Exactly. Yeah. All right. So, uh, you know, we're talking about cropping, talking about noise reduction. I wonder if maybe you could show us some examples of what, maybe where some of those things uh, came into play or how you dealt with that. Yeah, certainly. Um, you know, in fact, I've got some good examples right here I'll pop up. Um, talking about the sandhill cranes earlier. And uh, let me see if we're... Whoa! <laughs> There's the infinite chair. chair. Good. That means you're, you started it. There we go. There we go. All right. So, you know, using the sandhill cranes as an example, um, whenever you're dealing with animals and they're young, you're, you know, you have a potentially stressful situation. You don't want to spook them. You don't want to have a situation where an animal becomes defensive or, um, you know, feels that you're threatening their young. Any situation where, you, you know, you could potentially get between them and their babies. Um, we just don't want to do that. So, um, you know, pictures like this with these little, um, these sand hills, they, um, oops, let me get that out of the way. No, oh, there he is. Birds aren't often cute when they're little, but that's a very cute. Yeah. There's some that uh, they're downright a little scary. <laughs> <laughs> Sand hills are cute though, and yeah. you know the, you have your two different types of chicks. You have your helpless, um, kind of like people. They can't do a whole lot when they're little, and then you have ones like the sandhills, which are just going to be up and running within moments. They typically hatch. Um, they'll start hatching. It takes about 24 hours for them to get out of the shell. And they'll start hatching overnight so that by morning they're ready to run. And during this whole series, you know, I was talking earlier about life cycles, and there's some very key moments here that I wanted to capture, this being one of them. The chicks, the first few days, will seek shelter up on top of mom or dad. Um, in this case, I'm pretty sure this is mom. I identified them. They had slightly different markings and size, and dad typically is on the nest overnight. Mom's typically on the nest during the day. Um, so this was one of the shots I really wanted was to get the baby up on mom's, um, on mom's back. Now, if I go to the original of this, this was definitely a crop. This was a situation. It's the very first day. I'm going to take a lot of, um, pains to make sure that I'm not disturbing this, this, um, family here. Yeah. Let yeah. me jump to the, uh, so yeah, there's another version, um, I'm there, but this, you know, this was definitely a crop. This was something where I knew I was going to crop it after the fact, just the fact of being there capturing the moment, but also knowing that I've got a lot of megapixels to deal with, you know, that's a, it's going to be a bit of a crop. So there's right. the, the actual, the crop of the image. Um, so that's where I like to shoot a little looser in situations mm -hmm. like this. So I can mm -hmm. refine it afterwards. And especially if there's any kind of movement, um, things like that. So you can really refine the, uh, the, the composition. Yeah. yeah. So do you worry overly about, uh, you know, cropping too much? Like what, what is there a limit? Yeah, absolutely. And that's, um, you know, I always, part of my limit came, I did a, a photo competition tournament a number of years ago um, in Texas. It was the images for conservation fund. And what they did was it was 20 photographers and 20 landowners and you got blindly paired with the landowners and um, 
for a month, you photographed all the wildlife and landscapes that the ranch had. We we're trying to demonstrate biodiversity. And then we submitted all of our images and there were prizes for, you know, the, the photographers who captured the most and the most interesting photos and things like that. The general rule of thumb in that, that competition was you had to have 80% of the original pixels. Um, so you could crop but you had to have 80% still there. And that's been kind of my guideline. And I think that was a pretty solid, solid guideline. You're not getting into an issue where, you know, as you crop, you're going to limit the size you can reproduce it at. You know, you're limiting the, how big a print you can do. Um, you know, certain, some of the stock agencies certainly won't take them if they're big crops. So that's always been my rule of thumb is to stick with that, that 80% yeah. rule. And that seems to, to work pretty well. Cool. Cool. Noticing, I'm hearing a little echo when I'm talking. Hope that. Uh, oh, there we go. No, no. So maybe it was just in my head. I'm hearing my own voice. Um, <laughs> so I wonder if I could. Uh, I wanted to share a quick little cropping tip that um, you probably know, but uh, just in case it's new to someone else, um, that I I kind of only use this anymore because it's just I find it so so useful. So uh, so here is my screen up. Just. Because I'm not looking at it anymore. Yes. Make sure that there we go. Now should be. Hopefully, you're seeing it. Um, so if, hitting the R key obviously is is the quick thing. Hitting the I key to clear that info away, at least for now. And so the other thing I do is is lights out. Um, and so hitting the L key uh, brings me lights dim, and then L again lights out. And then I do shift tab, and I just try to get the most screen real estate so I could see the, the, for the image itself. And now the area that's outside my crop rectangle, I'm not, I don't have to be distracted by that, and I can really just focus on compositional concerns. Hmm. Um, and then if I think that I like that, uh, hit the L key again, I could bring back the I, uh, the info by hitting the I key again, and now I can see what my pixel dimensions are after I've done that crop. So if I am, you know, kind of at least a little concerned about that. Um, thing is, if I go too far and lights out, then you don't see the info overlay. But um, so you can get your your crop, your final crop pixel dimensions to show mm -hmm. as part of that. Uh, you know, if that's useful to you. So just want to just want to share that out there. I must have my infinite. Scroll yeah. there. There's a lot of useful things in cropping, and um, you know, between the angle tool is one I use all the time. You know, I do in additional wildlife. I do a lot of uh, a lot of landscapes, and yeah. I I don't know if I have one leg a little shorter if I'm just crooked to the world. What I always have crooked horizons. Yeah, I do too. <laughs> I'm very guilty of that. Yeah, it's the flask um, that you carry. That's yeah, that must be it. <laughs> um, so I'll use the angle tool a lot just to measure out the line and, and make it pop back. One of the things I really like with that, um, since I do a lot with water, is using that on reflections. Huh. And um, because in nature, you know, you know, the physics of light and dealing with mirrors and reflective surfaces, that whatever, whenever something is reflected directly below it, it will perfectly line up. Okay, so if you click something, you know, a, a characteristic, something in um, the picture, and then drag down to its reflection, it should line up perfectly. If it doesn't, then it'll automatically give it. So, as an example here, um, use this. Uh, this uh, snail shell that I did, this was just an indoor uh, rainy day project. So if I'm using the ruler tool, which is the, the angle here in the, the crop, I'm gonna pick something that is um, you know, very clear in this. In this case, it'll probably be the very center of the swirl and then drag down to that same thing in the, uh, the reflection. And you can see it just popped it just a little bit. Oh, I love that tip. This works really cool for things like trees, um, you know, because you have that nice straight trunk into the water. Um, you know, even if it's a little bit of a ripple, like this little uh, uh, teenage duck, he's a little little bit of a mess. But, um, <laughs> he totally looks I'll, like a teenager. Yeah, what I'll do a lot of times, I'll look for the catch light in the eye and try to find it. In this case, the ripple's a little much. So I'm just looking for anything that I can line up. In this case, I know the eye is probably about there, so I can pop it right to, to that, and that oh. way you get perfectly 
level images all the time. Yeah. And, and it's such a cool little thing, you know, with, with water, any kind of reflective surface. Now, something like this will be a little tougher, but in that case, I'll just use the line of either the horizon or you can use the line of the sun and just uh, verify. Because sometimes that horizon is a little deceptive. Um, yes. An island or a sandbar out there, yeah. it can throw you. So sometimes I'll come in here and just draw it right through the middle of that streak and that'll pop it to the correct angle. Very cool. Yeah, I think that, you know, that straightening, it, especially on images where there's not a horizon visible, like you, you know, yeah. Backward. But I think there must be something that's um, subliminal that, that triggers a positive or negative reaction. Like when something's off, you know, we notice it. We may not, you know, consciously notice it, but I think there's something about that that might that registers someone in your in their reaction to the image, and just that little bit of a tweak sometimes might just be the thing that doesn't trigger that, and that's that's really cool. I think yeah, that. it's interesting how we react to things, and um, as I've you know studied more over the years about composition and, and things like that, is you know we like symmetry and we hate symmetry all at the same time. Hmm. You know, we like things level, and it's the, the, the way we interpret our universe, we know there are givens. We know horizons are straight, but we don't necessarily like pairs of things. A lot of times we like even numbers. We like, you know, and it, it's huh. funny, you know, we react much better to triangles. And right. if you look at the geometry of, of things, um, anytime we can build geometry into stuff, it tends to make strong compositions. Um, and that's one of the reasons why, you know, going back to the crop tool, the other thing I like is the overlays in the crop tool, being able to flip between the different um, composition. Yeah, well, bring that up and just we'll just talk through that because that's yeah. Uh, people do uh, so that. Go ahead. And use one here. I, I think you know the thing about cropping is I I love to believe in cropping. I think it's really useful. Now some people are very purist in that they only crop in camera, and it's like okay, you yeah. know. God bless you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's your, um, thing, but um, yeah, but I think it just gives you a lot more freedom and flexibility to to make a tighter composition. Much yep. Image. And that's where you know something like this. There's a natural triangle here. If you look with the um, the body of the the dragonflies, these little damselflies. Um, these guys are all of about maybe an inch and a quarter, inch and a half long. Yeah. So to get this particular shot, I'm actually laying on, this was at a cattle ranch. And so I like to believe it was mud I was in, but <laughs> I'm pretty sure. <laughs> um, so what I'm doing here is I'm actually bracing this um, with my elbows in the mud, with my camera lens, maybe two inches above the water. Wow. And what was happening is these damselflies are, are it was mating season i guess and they're looking for prospective mates and they're landing on these little tiny bits of grass sticking out of the out of the water so um something like this there's just a natural geometry to it but what i found is when you're talking composition people reacted better to this one than the next in the sequence where the tail on the one on the left is down touching the water because it was almost too perfect it was okay. a perfect mirror image of each other yeah so that's where when I start looking at the crop, then there's a lot of extra negative space, all this blue that, you know, you don't really need. It's not really making the composition any stronger. So at that point, that's where I'm going to start playing with my crop to see, you know, what makes it just a little more, you know, in your face, leaves your eye a little bit more. You know, cause the, the, the idea with a good composition is that your eye is led around the frame. And that you don't just bounce around randomly without really understanding what it is you're supposed to be looking at. Yeah. And so to switch while you're there, yeah, oh. switching through the overlays uh, on the on the crop tool. Mm -hmm. So is it's the O key, right? And yeah, the it's o key, the you, o key. And as yeah. you start hitting that, you can see it flips through um, different different uh, overlays. Like there's there's diagonals, there's golden mean. Um, there's thirds, there's all kinds, there's the Fibonacci, the golden spiral. Um, and then what you can do also as you're going through like something in this where it's got the diagonals is if I remember correctly, if you hit shift, it'll actually rotate it back and forth. So 
um, you know, the, the golden spiral doesn't always have to come from one side. Mm -hmm. You can shift this around and see what it looks like uh, mm -hmm. from different um, perspectives. So it's really a cool way. And, you know, again, uh, you know, the key with all these rules is knowing when to break them <laughs> and yeah. when not to follow them. But it's kind of interesting when you're looking at something like this. All oh, right. Um, you know, there's... <laughs> hey, where'd that spiral come from? Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> there, there might be a, something to this spiral thing in nature. <laughs> yeah. So you can see how that spiral is repeated throughout this this image and uh, but also see how it works with other you can see you know the rule of thirds works with it um, the diagonals works with it so you know this one tends to get a pretty pretty good response yeah um, just checking over there's, uh, <laughs> there's uh, some comments and coming in and my good buddy Pete Rockwell is lots of fun facts um, <laughs> he's a Great guy. Hey Pete. Um, this is the but the perils of what I post on Facebook to come that I'm doing a live thing. Um, so people are putting in comments, hey Pete, you're actually now just entered to win the plugin just by sharing that fun fact. So uh, so David and, and uh, Mira and uh, Sarah Minner, I'm sorry if I butcher your names, John. So you guys are all entered in. That's awesome. And uh, any other questions? Fun facts <laughs> or comments, we love those. Just put them in the in the live feed there, and we'll uh, press on. So, uh, so other than so cropping, obviously is important. Um, and and we talked about. Do you have like a graphic design background? It sounds like you definitely have some kind of design. Yeah, I was the art kid, definitely. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I spent a lot of time doodling, sketching, and, um, you know, I got away from it for a while. I, I was in the, the world of cubicles for a bit, and, um, but it was always something that's been a part of me, and, um, you know, the, the, my backdrop was, I grew up on a farm, a little 50-acre farm at the foot of the Appalachians, so um, nature and art were just always a part of me, and, um, you know, for a lot of years, I got away from both of those things. I was living in a more urban environment, and um, I uh, was not doing as much with, with art, and that's when I, I caught the photo bug, so to speak, um, after my son was born, and I started yeah. carrying a little camera with me um, when I would take him on bike rides every day to get a little exercise, and uh, all of a sudden, uh, nature photography pretty much took over. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. So that's, that's where great. I got back to the art side of things, and really remember, you know, all those things I've learned in high school, you know, 15, 20 years before, and uh, that's all come roaring back for me. So now as I've become, and you know, the, the thing with photography is you don't just learn how to use the camera. You have to, and I know in nature, you become an ologist of everything, you know, I'm a meteorologist, biologist, you know, all those different things, but you really have to study art history and theory as well. And, um, you know, when you really, uh, one of the articles I wrote recently was the the um, about critiques, and um, that'll be actually I think that's coming out this week. Um, and it's really how you critique other people's work and do it in a way that you're both getting something out of it. And to do that, you really gotta you know when you take apart a part of picture and try to figure out what it is you like or don't like about it, and really think about that, um, it really makes you a, a more thoughtful photographer, and you start working those things into um, your own work and into the way you look at others. So what about uh, other important pieces that uh, bring in the viewer? So like color, do you change or manipulate or enhance color in any ways? Yeah, one of the things I do right from the start, and this starts in the field, is um, understanding the white balance. Okay. And color and color theory and, you know, Understanding both the science of color, the physics of what's going on there. Um, you know, we all talk about the golden hour and how wonderful the golden hour is. We all got to shoot in the golden hour um, and the blue hours and all those things. But why do we have the golden hour? Why do we have that? You know, what is the mechanism of that? And um, understanding what's going on there. Also, along with that, then, is understanding the art side of it, color theory, what colors work well together. So um, as a uh, example, when I'm out in the field then, and let's say I'm in a pine forest, one of the first things I'm looking at is what is the light doing? 
And in my mind, there's never really bad light. It's just different light and you do different things with it. But if I'm in that pine forest and it's heavily overcast, my camera's probably not going to do a good job of dealing with that in terms of auto white balance. So I need to remember that. I'm going to take um, reference shots. I use the, um, uh, the data color, the, um, sorry, I just... Lost it. So it's been a long week with the hurricanes. <laughs> yeah, you got, yeah, you're over. Your Hurricane Irma. Yes, um, but I do use uh, color reference, color pickers in the field when I can. It's like the little like passport color checker. Yeah, uh, actually, I use the cube. The, that's oh, it. the cube. Okay, spider cube because this is something that I can. Um, it's very portable, very small. It allows me to check my white, uh, capture neutral grays, capture blacks, whites, all that in, in one shot. Um, you don't have the luxury of going up to the bear and saying, here, can you hold this? <laughs> yeah, this you know? um, oh, yeah. So having something like that's really nice to be able to quickly reference your colors and uh, get back to, to the, when you get back that they're actually accurate. Um, the reason I use pine trees is because if you've ever been in a pine forest, you know, you have that wonderful um, floor covered in the rusty red pine needles. Nine times out of ten, when you shoot that, you're going to get back and you're going to have, like, grungy brown if you leave your camera to its own devices. So I'm shooting in the field knowing that odds are my camera's not going to handle the white balance there very well. And that one of the first things I'm going to do when I bring it into Lightroom is adjust that white balance, go back to my reference shot, use the color picker, and um, or use the reference shot, uh, use the white balance picker, and adjust that accordingly. Okay. So you would like have your reference shot that has the color chart in it of some sort, and then yep. sync those settings to the mm -hmm. image of the actual photo. Okay. Yep. Um, do you change the uh, camera profile? You have a um, I do. Um, I tend to play with the, you know, I, I'm generally just going to shoot in, you know, Adobe and, um, you know, the full RGB and go from there. Um, most of the time, what I'm going to do then is when I do bring it back in, I pop over under my camera calibration. I'll pop over to the camera standard just to see what it, the difference is. Um, very often that does look a little nicer. And, you know, my rule with Lightroom is always just do what looks good. <laughs> you know? yeah, sure. um, yeah, I don't have a hard and fast rule. Always use this one or always use that one. I just tend to do what looks good. And, you know, even the in the uh, in the field, if I'm shooting black and whites, um, I'll go ahead and shift my profile on my camera over to or my style over to, to monochrome just so I can see what it looks like. Because sometimes, you know, I don't I have an idea that, hey, this is going to look really cool in black and white. Sometimes I'm wrong. You know, our eyes are taking in a lot more contrast and, and dynamic range than the camera is. So what I think may look good as black and white may not translate to the camera. So I do check that back and forth in the field, knowing that I'm shooting in raw. I can always change it to whatever I want after the fact. Cool. Um, so I wonder if worth just putting that up on screen. Do you have maybe an image to show just so people have a reference for where that is in Lightroom? Yes, here, let me jump to one, give me one <laughs> While you're doing that, so I'm like another good friend of my, Ethan, hey Ethan, he's looking for tips regarding the best cargo shorts to wear for stock photography modeling, looking for maximum impact. Well, I, Ethan, I've got a pair that make your, your eyes pop out of your head. Uh, they're so amazing. So Ethan and I have some <laughs> stock photography history. Uh, put it mildly. So uh, maybe we get off the air, Jason. I'll show you the picture. <laughs> uh, <Okay. laughs> All right. So um, here's an example of um, Monarch Butterfly. <laughs> this was another life cycle series that I just did. Yeah, I remember um, when you had that. Yeah, this was very cool. And uh, it's, I had never filmed it up close, the actual moment of it coming out of the chrysalis. Um, think aliens. Think uh, really yeah, right. horrifying things going on. I, I really didn't know what to expect. So when it goes into chrysalis, at one point the head of the caterpillar comes right off. It's, yeah. it's really some strange stuff. Yeah. But you know, as an example, this is one where um, in a develop mode, <clears throat> what you're going to do is on the the panel come all the way down to the bottom where camera calibration is. 
and you can look any of the profiles available on your camera for the most part are going to be available here um, and you can see with adobe standard there's not much of a difference with this particular image you can see there's more opened up in the background here a mm -hmm. um, little bit more range it's got a little bit smaller i'm guessing a little bit smaller gamut in the camera standard but when i pop over to that you can see how that darkens up um, you actually end up with a little bit more rich orange here. So in this case, I actually like that more because I want that background to go away. Right. Um, to me, the background, you know, I'm a big believer in compose the background first when it comes to wildlife. Mm -hmm. um, that background should serve to enhance the image. It's not there to distract from the image. And you know, in this case, by just popping over that camera standard, we immediately take that what was a kind of busy bit of a background here and it's not that it's bad it's just between the two it's different yeah well the cameras the adobe standard used to be called the camera standard profile so over the years lightroom uh <laughs> they've evolved the the camera profiles and so if you're shooting raw one of the benefits is that you can in lightroom change that camera profile uh on the fly and mm -hmm. Lightroom can't read or understand what you might have chosen in camera. So for example, say you had chosen the black and white or monochrome mode on your camera and you were shooting in RAW. When you bring that into Lightroom, it's going to be in color, right? So Lightroom doesn't understand what you've chosen in camera. So it offers this in the camera calibration panel as a way to emulate or mimic the styles that, that might exist on your camera. And what, you, what you'll see in that list is gonna vary based on the, the camera that was used to take the photograph. And so uh, there's some standardization in there, so landscape, portrait, you know, that type of thing. Um, but some cameras, like Fuji's, have a lot of other styles that the Nikons and, and uh, Canons don't. Um, and then there might be some cameras that aren't as well uh, supported <laughs> that yeah. maybe only have one profile that's just uh, camera standard or Adobe standard. So um, what you see in there is what you get. But if you see embedded uh, as an option, that means you probably have a, a non-raw file selected, mm -hmm. like a JPEG or PSD or TIFF file. Yeah. Now, you know, an image like this, um, and this is where when we're talking about color earlier and making adjustments, uh, yeah, when I'm doing nature, doing landscapes, there's, in my mind, there are two different types of photos. There is the photo that is gonna go into the guidebook, who it's absolutely about color accuracy and representing the world. And then there's the gonna go on the living room wall, which is more fantasy, it's the, the Kincaid as <laughs> yeah. you know, Those we use color as a, a creative tool. In this case, you know, this is a monarch butterfly. It needs to be the right color. Uh, if I come up with a red butterfly or a blue butterfly right. instead of an orange one, we're going to have problems. And, and this is one where I knew at the time the white balance wasn't being handled great by the camera. So I'm going to shoot that knowing that, you know, actually this one wasn't so bad. It was another dad, my mistake. But that's where I'll come in and just use this color picker and um, find what I believe was a neutral in the scene and um, use that as a starting point and then adjust it from there. Right. Um, in this case, it was pretty, you know, um, pretty decent, but it does sometimes really have a tough time with those heavily shaded um, or dark scenes because, you know, those cameras are adjusting within a range typically was about 3,000 to 9,000. Sometimes the light just doesn't fall into those, that yeah. range with auto. So, um, you know, you may have to make some bigger, bigger adjustments. Now, do you ever use the HSL panel as well? To yes, I do. Um, quite a bit. And actually, I'm using it more and more as I've, as I've learned about it. Um, in fact, if I, let me jump back to that particular um, image. I don't remember if I, yeah, there you go. Yep. So in this case, there were some, a bit of a red cast to it. So I wanted my oranges to appear more orange. So, you know, in it, here I'm going to adjust the hues slightly. So I made my reds a little bit more orange, my orange a little bit less yellow. Um, and then I made my greens for the stem actually appear a little bit more green. 
So not only am I adjusting the white balance slightly, but I'm adjusting the balance of the colors as well. Sometimes I'll go further into saturation and luminance. Um, and a lot of times I'll actually start with the, uh, the little drag. Um, I forget what you call it, but. Um, the target adjustment tool. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> but you can see as I'm dragging that up and down, you know, it really makes a quite a difference. You know, I can yeah. So as you that. as you bring that target adjustment tool over the image, it's looking at the color of the pixel underneath where you're clicking, and you know there might be red, but there might be also yellow, or maybe you're you're clicking on the on the green of the uh, stem of the milkweed there. Maybe it's there's yellow and green in there as well. So instead of having to adjust individual sliders, um, you can kind of just adjust them all relative to that pixel. Uh, and, and also remember that it's, it's global. So if you had two butterflies in that image, we'd see those same uh, colors being uh, affected on both of the butterflies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and right below that, too, I also do use split toning a bit. Oh, okay, cool. Uh, um, you know, again, getting back to the whole concept of color theory, um, I like to use it to uh, differentiate. You know, you see this a lot in video and portrait with doing color grading and split toning where we're going to have a, a slightly different cast to the shadows versus the highlights. With some wildlife, this works really well. This is something you can very easily go overboard with, but just subtle little changes in it can uh, really have a nice effect in, um, in your photos. So. In this particular case, I just added a little bit of a tweak. Um, you can see here, if you, you click on that little box at the top, that's where you select your actual color. And in this case, I'm just going to add a little bit of orange to the highlights, um, uh, not too heavily saturated. And you can see right here, you can either drag it or you can color, hit it in the color picker up here, and then just add a little saturation of that. I'll come down here and for the shadows, I'll add most likely a complementary color. So if you're looking at the opposite of orangish yellow, you're looking at purpley blue. Mm -hmm. So that's where um, I'm gonna bring down here, this the darker areas, add a little bit of a blue tint to it, but not too much. Generally, I want one to be a little more saturated than the other. Um, and what that'll do is create this nice, subtle complementary color um, coloring in here where it differentiates your shadows versus your um, your highlights. You know, again, just real subtle, not a lot of saturation to it, but it can really create some nice effects in your images. Yeah, um, you know, a cool tip while you're in there, um, if you click on that on the color swatch again in the split tone, if you drag your cursor now over the image, you can sample. You got to kind of click, click into the color swatch and then drag out. Sorry, click in there and now just drag right into the over the butterfly. And you uh, can sample if you wanted to say pull the orange from the butterfly. Say, um, you can you can grab a color from the image. It's not the most intuitive uh, interface. Yeah, there's a few of those little hidden, <laughs> hidden things. Yeah. Cool. Um, but yeah, that's where, and, and I'll do the same thing with landscapes a bit, um, one I just did this morning. And again, this gets more into kind of the, um, the, the fantasy side of color, uh, so to speak, is um, you know, doing, uh, doing the color grading, but something like this, where I color graded out the, um, the purples. And you know, this is more of the kind of the fine art market but it's gonna work in a lot of different decors, and this is something that you can just go in and play with until you find what you like. It's like um, the Eye of Sauron there. Yeah, and this is the original image. Um, the camera left to its own devices shot this in, um, if I remember correctly, as shot was 6,050, okay? So it made it really, really yellow. Um, I came in and did a custom hmm. white balance, making it more blue just for the heck of it, and then came in and did the same thing with the uh, the uh, the split toning. Um, one of the things I almost always do too is bump that blue primary under cali camera calibration. It has a nice um, effect of um, very often making your colors a little bit more rich. Uh, <laughs> has a um, nice effect there. But you can see I did the same thing here as I was talking about before added just a little bit of subtle color into the shadows and the highlights. So you can see the two 
on here where we've got a little bit of blue and a little bit of um, yellow to really intensify that. And it creates this kind of magical, mystical scene. Cool. Um, so we've got about maybe 15 minutes left. I just want to remind folks, so we've got some great comments. Uh, people love the photos. Uh, they love my shorts <laughs> and they love uh, the cropping tips uh, and, and just your photos in general are just fantastic. Well, thank you. Um, so even if you're just doing a test like my buddy Ed, uh, that enters you in the giveaway. So uh, any questions uh, for Jason or me, throw those in there. Comments always welcome, even the most ridiculous ones as we have a couple of those. <laughs> um, it's nice to have friends, right? And right. They come and harass you. Um, so... What about uh, sharpening? That always seems like probably a big thing for wildlife and in general. Yeah, absolutely. And that's something where people can really um, go way overboard with. And the, the, you, when you're dealing with mammals and reptiles in particular, um, over sharpening is very, very noticeable in fur and scales. So I will err on the side of um, you know, under sharpening just a little bit in those areas. Um, I'm a big fan of masking and layering. Mm -hmm. So um, either doing that here, you know, using the mask tool um, in Lightroom. And, you know, just as a, a, a quick example, um, let me grab a, my little woodpecker here. Um, so, you know, something like this, I'm going to go in and use the brush because I really don't want to add any sharpening to that nice out of focus green background. All I'm going to do is make it start looking noisy, but I do want to sharpen these areas in here. So typically what I'm going to do with something like that is um, come in here and just start off, um, reset my brush so that I'm starting with, with nothing. And then I always like to add just a little bit of feathering to it just to kind of blend the edges. Um, and you can increase or decrease just using the bracket uh, keys. Those are uh, the hotkeys. I'm always kind of jumping back and forth um, to, to do that. And then I'll always use the show selected mask overlay, which is going to create, uh, show you exactly where you're masking. Now, the cool thing with this is if you hold down your control key, this will mask it, it's gonna look for edges. So as you're going along, you can see as I'm painting on that, even though I'm going over the side here by holding the control key, um, for the most part it's staying on, I jumped over a little bit far, it's staying on the tree, it's not jumping over here to the red. So right. I can come in here, and you know, over here I don't really care about it, but over here on the edge where I really wanna protect that edge, holding down the control or command key on Mac, I'm sorry, I'm a, I'm a PC guy, um, that will keep that mask right there on the um, on your subject, and then you can just come back in and fill any holes you might have missed as you're going. If you do get over, it's not a big deal. I just hit the erase key and come and clean that up. Same thing works if you use your con your command or control key. It won't come over and start erasing what you've laid down over on this side because you started here. Wherever you click, it's going to try to find that next nearest edge. So it's really a cool way to really control your masks and keep them where you want. Sometimes if I'm just you know, going around and um, uh, trying to mask stuff, you can get really, really messy really quick with it. This yeah. is it from, um, from doing that. So this, uh, my buddy Ed is, is now actually learning something. He didn't think he would <laughs> when he came here, but now he's... Um, so that that tip you just shared about holding down the command and control key when you're using the the brush tool mm -hmm. um, turns on the uh, auto mask. Yes. So it's like so you could check the auto mask box and have it on all the time, or if you're just painting away, uh, right. you can you can just click that and uh, and do that. So there, Ed, learn something. <laughs> Yeah, and that's what's cool is now that I've got that mask set up for just that tree, now I can do things, you know, that's, that sounds terrible. Now I can do things to the woodpecker. Um, <laughs> let me rephrase that. Um, you know, I can come in here and do adjustments specific to that and then work on just the sharpness in that area. Um, generally speaking, when, you know, we're going to screens, um, you know, most of our work is going to get shown first off on a computer screen. So sharpening is always the very last thing I do, and it is output specific. 
If I'm doing a print, it's going to have very different sharpening than what's going to go on a web screen. So typically, um, when I'm thinking for going on Instagram, Facebook, whatever those things are, it's going to get a bit more sharpening um, than it will in a print, um, just because it looks better on those displays with a little extra sharpening, in my opinion. Yeah. Uh, I got a question about clarity. Do you use clarity, and if you do, do you mask how you how you apply that? Yes, um, I do use clarity. That's actually one of my favorite adjustments. Um, and, and for those who don't know, and correct me if I'm if I if I mess up the terminology here, but basically, clarity is a mid-tone contrast adjustment for yeah. one of a better way to put it. And what you're doing with clarity is it almost has the effects of sharpening without sharpening with, and, and makes some of your, your tones a little, little more rich. Um, I love clarity for those reasons, but it is very easy to go overboard with it. So you do need to, I, I certainly do mask it. And in something like this, where let's say we go back into um, the, um, this uh, woodpecker, um, let's say, you know, in this case, I can really go crazy with clarity, but you can see what it's done there to the, the cap. That's just not a good thing. Right. So I don't want something like that happening. Um, on the other hand, one of the things I may do is actually come in over on the, um, where the out of focus green is. This is a nice way to make that even softer is I can go in and um, just mask that green and come in here and very quickly mask that off. Hey, while you're doing that, so a tip, like when you have the mask overlay turned on, it's, it's kind of a red overlay there, and it works fine on that green background. If you were masking the woodpecker's head, maybe it would be harder to tell. Yeah. If you press, uh, hold the shift key and O, I think just like with the crop overlay, it will cycle through the colors. Um, so you can have a green overlay, which wouldn't be great on your green background. Uh, mm -hmm. But sometimes, you know, it's, I, like, I like using the mask too, but if you can't actually see what yeah. you're masking because the color is too similar, then it's not happening. So, you know, in this case now, I can take that clarity and drop it down. If I were to raise it up, see how much more detail comes in those shadow areas, which is something I really don't want. I don't want this pulling away from the, the focal point of the image, which is the woodpecker. So I'll slide this all the way down. Sometimes I'll even add a little haze to it, um, okay. you know, just to kind of soften it a little bit more. Maybe, and you know, the, the dehaze has the effect sometimes of desaturating as well. So, um, you know, combining those things may actually work to take away um, some of the emphasis on that background. So if we're looking at our before, just with that one mask, we went from this was the before to that is the after. Right. And not that one's right or wrong, but you definitely are putting more focus on the tree and the wood type. Yeah, well, that's uh, the benefit of using those local adjustments is to, so hopefully, I think subtly works better, but you know, so it's, it's easy to go overboard. As oh, yeah. As well. Yeah. Uh, to start trying to, um, enhance where you want the eye to go and uh, kind of de-emphasize everything else. And that's, that's, those are great examples of that. And I'm a big, you know, I always use that, um, it's your backslash, backslash key? Yeah. yeah. Um, to go back and forth. I like toggling. Um, you know, you can look at your before and after, um, if you like side by side, it, it's really a personal choice on that. Um, I just like I like to be able to see it doing that and toggle back and forth um, and I'll also soft proof it um, usually again if I know soft proofing is just a rendering of the, um, the image on your intended output device in this case I've just set it to sRGB um, because this is how it's going to look on a browser window for the most part okay. so um, with soft proofing you can see if you're losing any color in this case it looks pretty good regardless. Um, but if say I was going to print it, um, let's see, oh, here we go. Um, uh, we're going to print it on a metallic print with a uh, white house custom color. You yeah. can see how my colors have shifted quite a bit. So that's yeah. something I'll, I'll 
keep in mind as well. Color is everything when you're dealing with um, wildlife and landscapes, you know, in terms of accuracy, but also in terms of saturation and, and um, vibrance. And the more, you know, accurate those colors are, the more it seems to bring your, your subject alive. Excellent. So we got about uh, five minutes left. So any last comments, wise or not <laughs> questions? <laughs> uh, welcome. Get those in there, and you get entered in to win. And um, just, I'm wondering, uh, Jason, if you use any plugins with Lightroom, do you do you just use Lightroom alone, or do you go other other? Plugins? No, I use a whole wide variety of things. Um, I. Uh, just started recently using, again, because I'm a PC guy, I've kind of felt left out of the McFun. <laughs> uh, but I have started using Aurora and Luminar. I love both of those. I was a long-time user of NIC um, plugins. And yeah. I loved them until the whole project just kind of oh, no. died. It's very sad. Um, and, you know, in fact, Silver Effects was probably one of my favorite black uh, and white plugins for a long, long time. So, um, like my Gator shot here, this was done with Silver Effects. And, um, you know, I really, really like that. Um, I do a lot of my HDRs. I've switched back and forth between a variety of programs over the years. It's kind of, like, you know, programs have one up each other. So I've gone back and forth between Nix. Uh, HDR, Photomatics, and now um, I've been learning how to use Aurora. So um, I've been very happy with, um, with those, and I, I tend to take things straight from Lightroom. I like using them as plugins. I'll do the same with Photoshop as well. And I also do a bit of editing in, in Photoshop depending on the particular image. I find I do that a lot with um, um, uh, black and whites in particular. Mm -hmm. As an example, this is one done in Aurora. Uh, okay. Uh, just a couple, you know, two days ago. Is that on the on Photo Focus on the website? Yes. Yeah. Okay. That was, I was like, that looks really familiar. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I just did an uh, article, first impressions on Aurora twenty eight. Uh, okay. uh, so uh, check that out if you're interested. It's really a what I did was I compared uh, for the the um, uh, Nick. Straight out, of, uh, straight out of the camera, which is usually not good. Um, the Nick software, uh, Photomatics, and Aurora. And um, in most cases, I actually liked Aurora the best for what I do. Um, but you know, it was a very, it was a close toss-up between Aurora and, and Photomatics in some cases. And, and some of it does come down just to uh, to personal taste. Sure. But what I liked was it really kept all these reads and things sharp um, mm -hmm. because there was a little bit of movement in them but it's did a really good job at figuring out the ghosting yeah um, that's it, a good test and um really making some smart choices on that um oh well, my, my buddy vanelli is watching while driving that's not a good idea v no yes. I, I'm gonna have him up in uh, south dakota with me in two weeks yeah well you can scold him in person experience. uh uh, Mir is asking, uh, where can I find the best textures to add? So uh, maybe she's thinking more like compositing textures? Um, yeah, sure. With compositing, honestly, one of your best tools is your own phone. Um, yeah. And there are some really great tools. Uh, what you want to do is if you have the whole Adobe uh, package, um, is Adobe um, Capture is great. You can make your own textures. Other than that, because um, you know, I'm just I walk around all the time taking pictures of things just for textures. I see a brick wall. That's that's cool texture. Um, so making your own is really the way to go. Then you don't get into any copyright issues. It's yours. <laughs> you don't have to you know give any attribution for it. So look up Adobe Capture. It's a great tool. I actually have a lot of fun messing around with it, and it's something for your phone, and then you can capture textures anytime. So I think the 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 app, the Capture app, is free, but I think the um, if you have the subscription one of the subscription mm -hmm. then it also syncs back to your um, to Photoshop or to yeah to the cloud storage that it that comes with is that right yeah, yeah. Um, yeah I played around with that one a little bit I haven't. you know and, and as an example um, I do a bit of digital art also okay. so um, textures are I've got thousands and thousands of textures most of the textures I really like are ones that I've just you know created on the fly. Um, and you can find stuff around your house all the time that you can grab textures from. Yeah. Yeah, excellent. Well, um, 
So I'm, I'm rummaging through my hat here. I got we've had a lot of comments, <laughs> good and bad. And it's really actually really great to see all these folks in here. Uh, and so I've reached into my hat here. So our so the way we do our our giveaway here is uh, I will pick your name out of this hat and. Um, You've got to just say that you're still here. So just do, you know, game show run down. I can't hear you screaming, but just type in the chat on the, on the live stream page and just let me know you're still here. And then once we confirm that, then you're going to just email me, rob at photofocus.com. Send me an email. So I have your email, and then I'll get you hooked up with the, uh, with the license code for the perfectly clear uh, plugin. Uh, who wins the Tesla? It's Ed, my buddy Ed's asking, who wins the Tesla? I'm afraid it's it's none of you. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, they bagged out at the at the end. Uh, I thought I had uh, Elon on here as a sponsor, but uh, bagged out. So sorry, no Tesla this week, you guys. You guys, listen to all this time for nothing. Um, just perfectly. I'll give you my call and talk to him about it. Yeah, please do that. All right. So our first winner, uh, and I apologize if I butcher this name, is uh, Sarah Sari Sarimner Sarimner Sarimner. Surrender. Uh, if you're still here, please just chime in, and I apologize for whatever I massacred that name. Um, and my second winner is Myra. So if you two are still here, just chime in on the chat and uh, let me know you're still here, and then we'll get you connected with that. So Jason, while we're closing out here, um, where can people learn more about you or find out if you're doing workshops or if you're going to any place sure. cool? Yeah, um, our website is hannaturephotography.com, or you can check me out on Instagram. I'm Nature Photographer Jason. Um, I'm posting on there almost every other day uh, new work. And um, if you want to have a really cool experience, I'll be in South Dakota in just a few days. Uh, every year we do the it's called the photo the Black Hills Photo Shootout. It's a weekend long photo festival in the Black Hills, oh, yeah. uh, celebrating all things photography. And, uh, I think my friend Tess goes there. Do you know Tess? Tess, do you do that? You still here? I think she goes there. Oh, your cat just wildlife just walked through the back of. Yes, yeah, one of the herd. herd. <laughs> I, I have a soft spot for little orphans. And yeah, they were abandoned in my backyard. Uh, Spoiled. Good for you so. taking them in. They're definitely checking checking you out now. Well, it yeah. looks like our two winners are here. Excellent. So. Um, for our two winners, uh, just send me an email, rob at photofocus.com, and um, I will uh, get back to you. We'll get that. Well, probably may not happen immediately. I got to like email someone else. They got to email me, but we'll 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 hook you up. And uh, thank you guys for tuning in. Um, Jason, thank you so much uh, for spending this hour with me and sharing that info and your great photos. And I'd love to go to that. Come on, up. Shoot out. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> awesome. Uh, I haven't been up that way in a really long time, too. Yeah, so. it's, it's beautiful up there. So, but yeah, thanks for having me. It was a lot of fun. All right, well, uh, good luck to you for the rest of the hurricane season. And, Thank you. Uh, hope that everything just blows out to sea. And yes, spares, spares everybody gives everybody a break. Um, so, I'll see you around at photofocus.com. And uh, thank you very much. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. See you next month, October. 18th, I think, whatever that third Monday, I think, in October is. We'll be back here again. So uh, take care, everyone. Thanks a lot. Bye.